My name is Chris Gethin, and what I aim to bring to you is inspiration, motivation from clients, everything that will allow you to evolve as a human being. Okay, why do I look so fucked? Because I just trained with Milos. I surrendered myself to Milos's principles. I knew it was going to be bloody nasty because I've seen him train and he's kind of notorious for what he does, but I've never experienced it. And there was a, there was a little bit too much mystery there for me Yeah. where I didn't know what to expect. And it was just like, this has to be the last exercise. This has to be the last rep, but it wasn't. Now you mentioned over there on the gym floor that uh, this is the craziest pump you in my delts, for sure, and my biceps, for sure. If you heard me speak, sometimes I say, uh, what is our goal when we step the foot in the gym? Maximal stimulation or maximum amount of muscle fibers of a targeting muscle group. Okay, so biceps, delts, right? So when I when you came in, we went on the gym floor, said, how can I trash Chris's uh, muscle fibers without risking too much, right? So we have some certain limitations, you have 48 and 58, we have to train smart, right? So, but I have to bring you to that uh, brink of death, like when you are in a, that the deep waters and uh, you don't know if you're gonna swim out of it. Uh, so we did uh, uh, just about every angle, you know, different tempo, different type of contraction. I, I made you uh, mix explosive with super slows and stuff like that. And uh, I bring, five movements in a one exercise, which you probably never did. No, <laughs> no. So your, your certain nervous system have to, you know, fire specifically to do this, 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 that, right? You go here, you go slow, there you go explosive. Then I gave you just eccentrics, you know, prolonged peak curve contraction. But uh, basically, whoever's going to see this video, it was not staged. You had no idea what you're going to do, right? And this is how I, first time I train you, I exposed you to this kind of volume and intensity, you survived, right? And my job next time if I would ever train you is to raise the level, up the notch, right? So uh, nobody can train like this on their own. It's impossible. It's impossible, yeah. But uh, you had that drag and of course you had respect for me, so uh, you let me. Of course, yeah. yeah. yeah so, and I enjoyed it. Listen. Because I've been there, done that, right? Uh, many times, okay, uh, I asked her to give me the number between um, 30 and 50, right? Literally speaking, with Sonny Schmidt. You know, yeah, yeah, Sonny. Uh, it's okay. Throw the number. And I would say 55 on some hack squats. And he'll be so annoyed and pissed off. Say, ah, that's not your issue. That's po not possible. Then I would jump in and I'd do 55 reps in your face, Sonny. Now what, right? Uh, when I started doing the giant sets with the, all my guys, as you know, he watched. So I told him, we're going to do this, 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 right? And the same thing, ah, oh, this is impossible. So when I heard it impossible, I went and did it right in front of them. And then they had to shut up and do it itself, right? Yeah. So uh, I've been there. So I, I know the human mind is somewhat uh, limiting, right? And you, you just don't go for the, okay. No matter what, I'll do it. So today you did it. And I take my hat off to you. I mean, there was uh, moments that I, I thought that you might uh, want to quit because your, your muscle was completely empty and failing, right? But you continue. So my uh, all this stuff goes to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, because the, it's very easy, especially on high repetitions, that the mind quits before the body. Of course, if you're on low repetitions, heavyweight, the yeah. body fails, the body fails. But when it's high repetitions like that, yeah. that's what really separates the men from the boys. Because like, okay, how bad do you want it? I think you were doing the majority of the exercise sometimes, especially like on those slow repetitions, they were soul destroying. When it's like five second negative and then five second contraction, like I felt like you were doing all of it. But just knowing that you're going into areas that are just fully uncomfortable, that is only going to allow you to progress, to evolve, if you can get comfortable within that discomfort zone. We force new adaptation, this new type of simulation for your body, something that you are not accustomed to, and uh, you already adapted in this workout. The next workout adaptation is going to be even greater. If you train like this for a couple of weeks, you really become a crazy machine.
I mean, uh, I promise you that one. But uh, uh, I was going to say something, and then my, my chin of thought went away. Uh, the thing is just, uh, you start, and no matter what, I'm going to finish. Uh, I didn't expose you to exactly everything. So I'm going to tell you, every rep has those four points. You have a, a eccentric, right? You have a completely lengthened, their consumption uh, completely LMP. position. Yeah. So I would play with these four points. I could get you 10 seconds down, right? Or nine and eight, seven, uh, eccentrically. I can have you in a stretch position. I didn't want to insist on that today to keep you with that stretch overload for a prolonged period of time. I, I skipped it because you'd probably be completely exhausted. Then you experience slow concentrics, right? A lot of experts would tell me, oh, this is waste of time, that's not productive, you don't uh, trigger the high threshold motor units, and it's... Have you tried super slow concentrics on this balancing, on uh, shoulder presses, which you did today, yeah. right? on uh, uh, Smith machine presses, incline presses, on uh, hack squats, and on uh, bicep scrolls, which you did, yeah, right? yeah. Slow concentrics are absolute nightmare, right? And there's a different level of contraction. We uh, talk about continuous tension, time under the tension, but there is maximal tension that's completely different, right? I can squeeze a little bit or more and more and more and more, right? So every muscle, we contract as much as we need to complete that movement. Right? I would tell you, squeeze the juice out of the lemon, right? Squeeze yeah. It's like your life depends on it. A lot of people don't go for that really crazy pre-contraction. Uh, today, uh, I, I think it would be not realistic if I if I made you squeeze for ten seconds, no. squeeze for nine, right? Because <laughs> I wanted to still, you know, keep very good uh, workouts. So whoever is watching, they can apply it. But uh, I would probably progress into this in the next couple of workouts with you. Yeah. I'm definitely going to be giving this a go. Like, yeah. what really shocked me as well is sometimes, like, you'd have that one second, then it was two exactly. seconds, then three all the way up to ten. It was just not only shocking the body, but shocking the mind and taking myself definitely into dark waters, an environment that I couldn't see coming, you know? Now, when you're doing the, you know, that sort of rep range and that sort of intensity, you know, a lot of people would say, well, this is going to be slow twitch muscle fiber. Uh, sorry, yes, yeah, slow twitch muscle fiber work, but it's definitely working the fast twitch. Uh, and so what do you say about people that say, this is just going to be slow twitch and nothing but this is more of an endurance well, workout? Listen, when you review your workout, I kept you on a six reps. Yeah, yeah, only. for sure. And that's then it's, drop and then do another it's, exercise. It's, so, and you were, you were starting on that and I was saying, uh, no, but look, we have a, uh, the, different types of hypertrophy. We have a sarcoplasmic, we have myofibro. Yeah. So I know that you're a power guy and you're super strong. I heard, uh, I mean, that you, you can really look the weights. Uh, it's normal for a man that, okay, uh, we want to show the strength and we want to yes. go all out and see where, where that limit is, right? But uh, when you go all out, what does it really mean? Can I isolate the muscle to go all out? or I'm just going to do the movement and use all the supporting muscle groups. You know, so I, I stay away from that. Uh, uh, I'm not going to say ego training because uh, I respect people that can, uh, that can do that. But I make my weight heavier and harder by introducing those uh, uh, prolonged uh, time under tension, prolonged peak contraction, prolonged eccentric concentric stretch position, these kind of things. Uh, at the point that I'm at, uh, I wish I listened to my father back in the day when he says, listen, now you are young and you think you can lift the, the, the world, you can lift the, the house. Uh, your body is not designed to be pounded with this kind of intention yeah. day in, day out for years. And uh, as we know now, many top pro bodybuilders, older, they have so many injuries. Yeah. It's just... It's not smart to train that way. It's, uh, it's ego training that really, if I can achieve the same type of failure, complete muscular failure, not just mental, because, you know, whoever trains with me, mentally this. Yeah. In order to, to finish this mentally, but complete muscular failure. 
I would actually let you pretty much die and you can't even move for another inch, which I noticed with you today, as long as you can move half inch and one inch, you keep going, you keep going. And I like that because uh, John Brown back in the day, I trained with him. He says, as long as you can hold the bar and attempt another rep, it's your duty to attempt. Yeah. Uh, so th this kind of things. But uh, uh, I've witnessed in the uh, last 40 years, uh, top pros that never went anything under 15 repetitions, which is slow twitch fiber specific, right? Yeah. Enormous size. I mean, that uh, you cannot compare it. If you would just look at the body, you would think this guy is a heavy duty guy. No, no. with all his uh, super sets, giant sets, uh, high repetitions. Mohammed Benaziz is yeah. one of the examples, right? But when you look at his height and uh, proportions, I mean, he was so heavily muscled. But, uh, and, then, and then you look at people like Branch Warren, like look at the size of his legs, and he'd always do high repetitions with his legs. Uh, and it goes to show. Yeah, it goes to show. So look, I mean, if you just go that science, you know, one to five repetitions is strength, and then, you know, six to 12 hypertrophy, and then the six to five, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. You know, it doesn't work that way. You can make uh, any amount of uh, repetitions work. And even with strict form, you can still get very much injured yeah. when you're going heavy. It doesn't give you that longevity. You could look at someone like Ronnie Coleman and go, okay, well, maybe his form could have been better. Yeah. But then you look at someone like Dorian, who had textbook form, textbook. but still got injured yeah, because right. of that repetitive, repetitiveness of that heavy, extreme load. I appreciate you saying this. I trained with Dorian, and there was uh, many times in Birmingham, in his gym, in my gym, and then in those Venice a few times. Uh, he was doing very heavy with the uh, uh, picture perfect form, right? And he tore his biceps and triceps and everything. Uh, this uh, a scar that I have, right? That's uh, uh, my patella tendon exploded doing super slow hacks. I mean, he could not, I mean, you see me do this super slow, right? Yeah, you know, six, eight, ten seconds down, hello, six, eight, uh, okay, so. Absolute control, but there was such a heavy weight. So when, when you do, I was doing like uh, uh, three-way squats first, one, two, three, four, five, six, six and a half plates. Then I would go to the hack squats and start with six plates, eight plates, ten plates. You know, so I actually felt, I thought, oh, I'm so pumped. I, I thought it was my VMO, like my, my dialysis. But there, there was a signal, my patella tendon was oh, sending oh, right. a nice I didn't read it correctly. We, did you even have knee straps on at the same time? I had it. Yeah, I wow. Straps, and I mean, really, I did a six plates, perfect. Eight plates each side, perfect. And uh, this was like my fourth rep. I literally speak, like, there was no uh, momentum, inertia, you know, power movement. It was just like, I would tell you, go slow down, pass the paro, zero uh, initiation, just a muscle contraction. So even if you do it, as you said, most perfect form, the load uh, sometimes could be too much of the muscle, too much of the tendon or a joint. And uh, that's what we were facing today, right? You have a several uh, tears, yeah. including a tricep. So uh, triceps training was not super intense because we are limited. But you see, you can either risk the injury and I expose you to some movements that will be risky. 99 out of 100 times you would get injured yeah something when, when your body is uh, sending you signals yeah you got to listen now when it comes to this style of training that you're doing like i know from back in the day you used to be a high volume trainer and you train frequently as well pre-contest double workouts yeah. now with this style of training how often of course, it all depends on the individual, how they're able to recover. But, you know, as a guide, how often can someone train like this? I'm, I'm super happy that you ask that question. And I don't know how often do you train. I train like I, this. Five days a week, usually, yeah. I train six days a week, twice a day, like this for 15 years. Twice a day, like this. Yeah. Yeah. Six days a week. Six days a week. And, and uh, I hardly, I'm not going to say I never felt overtrained. There was the times that, you know, like, okay, now you feel it and then you back off, you know, but, but seriously, 
higher demand forces higher depletion. So as you see today, we didn't risk anything, right? It was very intense, very stimulatory. If you had a proper nutrition, you would have a great response, muscular sorry, and hypertrophy. Yeah. But you would recover because if I train each body part twice a week, it's only twice a week. And I didn't expose this to anything like murderers that now I'm going to have to recover for a week or two weeks. So uh, I'm very loud about this uh, uh, motion nowadays. Overtraining, overtraining, overtraining. Jeez. People are under-recovering. Under-recovering. And, and, and look, if you think you can or if you think you can, you're always right. Yeah. So if you think that you cannot recover, you will not recover. I mean, uh, listen, uh, we are in the ocean, and uh, push into the ocean, you have to swim. It doesn't matter there is no island anywhere, you're going to swim until you find the island, right? Yeah. So that's how I say in my training, and it just happens that twice a day, somebody throw me into the ocean, I'll do it. And I, no, seriously, I uh, counted, I have these journals, I don't know if you've ever seen, I actually find it today, another one, I'm going to... I'm going to publish a few pages of my Instagram because it's interesting. People like to see my actual contest prep, what I did, you know, so I'm going to do this. But I counted 550 workouts in average uh, for uh, per year for 15 years. Right? Wow. Yeah. I never felt overtrained, I promise you. And uh, uh, another thing. And you'd hit every muscle group twice. Twice a week. Uh, twice a week, yeah. Twice a week. And I tell you this, uh, uh, originally, yeah, I thought... You know, more you train, the better it is, of course. And initially, when I uh, trained like three hours a day <laughs> and I didn't have a proper nutrition, I, I got smaller. It was enough. But once I realized, okay, my training is my anabolic phase of the day. We have 24 hours a day. I can have a fat burning phase of the day, maintenance phase of the day, and anabolic phase. This is how I approach everything. Uh, what does it mean? Maintenance phase is like when you know your caloric requirement and you keep that caloric requirement from meal to meal, okay? Yeah. Being inactive. When I'm training, as you know, normally, many, many, many years, training was catabolic event. You come in, you trash the muscle fibers, microtears of uh, uh, muscle fibers, uh, ATP loss, amino acid loss, glycogen loss, everything, and then your body replenishes, yeah. right? But uh, uh, I learned this back in the day from my father, that for the love of God, you have only that one opportunity during the day when you train to deliver all this blood to the muscle. So if blood is supplied with exact nutrients that you want to deliver, and you know how to manipulate them, you can insert all these nutrients straight into the muscle. So instead of becoming a catabolic event, it's anabolic. And that's why I say it's my anabolic phase. So when I realize, oh, this is a time that I can grow and insert something, do I want it once a day or twice a day? This is why I came up with a, I don't know how the more opportunities to insert. So I train twice a day, six days a week throughout my whole career. And then when you went to the twice a day, mm -hmm. did your nutrition change? Because I know there is a huge component of taking essential amino acids for sure during your workouts, glycogen during your workouts. Yeah. Is that when you started incorporating that just to help you to recover? Yes. You see, the, the, the thing is, uh, once I realized and uh, how the, my father really explained to me, and, and, I, and I know that you do this uh, similar thing and you have the same kind of uh, thinking. Uh, we have a six liters of blood, right? Right now, for me, maybe 10% is in my muscle. 20 minutes ago, it was 60% of the blood in, uh, in uh, all the muscle fibers that we were training. Yeah. Right? So now, if you trigger, okay, certain things, you trigger insulin release in your bloodstream when the blood is saturated with nutrients and blood is in the muscle and uh, you're doing all these contractions, what is going to happen? Insulin drives everything out of the blood into the first available cells and tissues. The only available cells and tissues are muscle cells. Each muscle contractions open up the cell, whatever muscle fiber, muscle cell, they did this and this and that, brachialis, brachioradialis, biceps, short head, long head, right? Yeah. I expose you to that, okay? Contraction and now insertion is like nailing amino acids and glucose and ATP and everything 
straight into that muscle. When my father back in the day explained me that, uh, uh, can you visualize this? Can you understand that? I said, like, this makes perfect sense. Why nobody else is doing it? And I, I tell you, even whoever is listening to me, they're going to say, oh, here, he, here he goes again about hyperemia advantage theory. It is but for the muscle. That's my theory that I constantly talk about it. But people are listening, but they don't hear it. So I want even, you know, you right now to tell me why when people know that, okay, they're coming to the gym and they want to stimulate the muscle or they would like to create hypertrophy, uh, build, not break down, anabolism, not catabolism. Mm. And uh, all this blood is going exactly into the exact muscle that you're training. If you saturate that blood and you create insulin release during a training, it's going to insert everything that is in the blood in exact muscle fiber that you're training. I said this many times, you want to uh, fly the air, uh, airplane from here to whatever, Europe or Australia with no passengers, you know, or you want to fill it up and uh, have a most valuable flight. Yeah. If I train, I want to have a most valuable training. And if I'm not prepared, I don't have a, it's empty blood. It's going to go through it and nothing's going to physiologically happen. So this is why I insisted. My father, when he told me this originally, like every teenager, you don't want to listen to your father. Yeah. I don't know why, right? Most intelligent, educated person, making perfect sense, so I didn't want to listen. But then it, it really, I had a sleepless nights, thinking like, this made so much sense, let me try it. So at that time, when I started implementing essential amino acids we had in a, a Serbian pharmacies for renal patients, and uh, uh, glucose, you can buy in uh, any supermarket, dextrose, right? I start using just this, my intra-workout. People accuse me of using steroids. At the time, I didn't know what steroids are, right? But I was getting such incredible gains and visible pumps that would last and every succeeding workout that looked better. And you know that progress is the name of the game, right? We, we can maximize something or we can compromise mm -hmm. you know if you go and you don't honestly answer your questions you want to maximize it so for me i wanted to maximize your uh, simulation today in uh, biceps and uh, shoulder in training and i'm super happy as a coach as a trainer right i think we had a great workout yeah phenomenal right? okay so now if you follow that to be the specific supplementation intra workout, right? And then specific diet throughout the day, 24 hours, you have a caloric requirement, you have your anabolic nutrients, you have recovery nutrients. Check, good training, good nutrition, good day, good week, good month, good year. Guess what's going to happen? In a few years, you're going to be on Olympia stage. Yeah. Now, with that style of training, of course, I can see we're definitely having that immediate like glycogen and es essential amino acids. Now, there's going to be some people I can only assume are going to say, well, I train like eight reps. My liver is going to store enough glycogen. I'm going to have enough essential amino acids from the food that I eat. Is that the case? Or would they still need to supplement so, with look, it? Uh, that's what um, uh, Dave Palumbo once in uh, our debate was saying, like, well, uh, you can drive the car with a half gas tank, you don't have to fill it up, right? It's still going, right? And he was referring to my uh, glucose delivery during training. He was saying it's not necessary because you have a glycogen stored. Glycogen stored in the muscle, it's energy reserve. So you're dipping into reserve. Why? Because you didn't, you compromise, you didn't supply nutrients that your body needs. Your muscle needs glucose. And the only reason why it's going to go to the glycogen storage is because you didn't give that glucose. All right. If you do give the glucose, now you can maximize it, right? So glycogen depletion also is costly process. You know, it costs you calories. And you're digging into your reserve. Another thing that uh, if you trigger hyperglycemia from your glucose or uh, glucose polymer that you're taking, you're releasing insulin. It's a dramatically higher insulin release from that than glycogen storage would ever give you. So you have now a most potent anabolic hormone, right? Mm -hmm. 
uh, storage hormone, not selective, it's going to push everything in, triggered by that glucose and maintenance of glucose, because you're drinking intra workout in between sets, right? Glucose goes in the bloodstream within three minutes. So you constantly have a, a constant delivery of glucose. Insulin is constantly being released. And insulin takes those essential amino acids and creatine and glutamine, beta and citrulline, everything and inserts them. So for me, yeah, uh, can you do it without it? Yes. But is this maximized? Far away from. So you know, this, this is how I look at it. Uh, just because your body can find a way to survive and to function. Because uh, let, let's face it, what is number one physiological preference of the body? It's always energy. No life, no energy, no life. Mm -hmm. So that energy has to be stored as a reserve. Body fat, fat is a store, storage. Carbohydrates is a storage. Protein is a muscle, right? So we are muscular guys. We, uh, the extra muscle mass is just energy reserve of a muscle protein, right? Yeah. And if you cut the carbs and cut the fat and you have nothing, your body is going to use your, uh, your protein as energy source, right? It doesn't work another way. Carbs and fat are only energy nutrients. Protein is only building nutrients. But pro protein can become energy nutrients in case you don't have these. So now you destroyed all the, uh, not destroyed, you empty all your glycogen yeah. from in first, and then you are on a strict diet and you lose all the body fat. Okay, so now we have a zero fat energy reserve, zero carbohydrate energy reserve, your body is going to still be using your lean tissue, degrading your muscle protein and uh, having this extra energy for, again, some prolonged period of time until you die. Yeah. <laughs> So just because your body can find a way to survive, does it mean that this is the optimal way for the athletes, for uh, bodybuilders that want to be extreme muscular hypertrophy? So th this is what I'm saying. There's many ways to roam, right? I can give you the, the small little boat and go to Italy, or I can give you a jumbo jet, right? I prefer to go in a jumbo jet. Yeah. You know? <laughs> okay, so with the way that you train that intensity and the frequency, especially when you were competing, like you always stayed in pretty decent shape all year round. Did you feel the need to do as much cardio in your off season when you're training like that? Why would we do cardio? Uh, so anything you do in life, it has to be a reason for it. If you are lean and you have no body fat, why on earth would I do cardio unless I just need my cardiovascular health? Yeah, right? yeah. But you experience this kind of training. This is, uh, somebody said, okay, uh, I think that Dorian or somebody uh, mentioned, okay, this is cardio training. <laughs> you know, like my, my giant sets and everything. That respiratory exchange ratio, right? The, the, what substrate you use, fat as a fuel or carbs as a fuel. So the RER1, is pure glucose. Zero point seven is pure fat. Well, my type of training does anything in between. So you don't burn just uh, glucose here. You burn some fats as well. Uh, I hardly did cardio back in the day when I was doing this uh, two types, uh, two two workouts a day. John Meadows, for example, same thing. I mean, he would hardly ever do the cardio. But the, your uh, question. Should I do cardio? What would be a purpose for me to do the cardio? Oh, I need to have my fat burning phase a day because I need to lose some body fat. Hmm. Then I would do the cardio, of course. You know, I would do because the aerobic activity is fatty acids as a fuel. If I do it in the correct times, I can use my fatty acids and burn with some fat, beautiful. But if I don't need it, why on earth would I do it? I really, I mean, this, this is the question. So you are also known, and I, I take my hat off to you, super lean year round. Let's speak the truth. Do we, bodybuilders, and athletes, and men, want to be in shape year round, or just for a contest? Let ourselves go, be off season, eat big to get big, excuse to get fat out of shape, to build, you know, size. Muscle building, 
is completely different than just, you know, packing on the weight. Yeah. You know, so, you know, my, my principle is, you see, I have a fat burning phase, it's needed. It's needed. If I don't need it, I would just have my anabolic phase, you know, eating. I never ate junk food. What would be a purpose for junk food? Really? Yeah, when people, when people justify their refeed really? to have a cheap meal. I mean, if it's for brain and because you really, you know, want to eat something, uh, but if you eat something that you know it's inflammatory and not healthy, it's just excuse for big uh, refeed. Yeah, I'll let my refeeds be good carbohydrates. Clean. That I want, yeah. Yeah, clean. I, I mean, really, uh, if you look at my journals, maybe twice a year, 365 days a year, right? maybe twice a, a year, I will let myself eat something that maybe I don't supposed to. Because for me, uh, I was competing in the 90s with uh, the best. Sean and Kevin and uh, Dorian and Master. I mean, everybody. Did I have a commodity of uh, doing anything less than 100%? So I know that I was disadvantaged. Those guys were better, right? And just to be, I qualified for Olympia 10 years in a row in the 1990s. And I think only Sean Ray did every qualification in 1990s. Yeah. I was qualified from 91 until 2000, 10, 10 years in a row. Uh, I would not put anything in my mouth that didn't belong there. Do you think it helped as well that you competed so much as well throughout the year? I think. Yeah. I mean, I, again, you see, that uh, principle of let's lie to ourselves and have excuse of, oh, I need the off season to grow. Yeah. You just competed. I competed at the highest level IBB pro event. My first pro show, San Jose, I qualified for Olympia. So my first pro show, I was top three, beautiful, qualified for Olympia. Do I now really need to say, okay, I need time to grow. I'm going to spend a whole year and two years, you know, to put more mass. I want to put more mass. I was putting more mass from show to show with my principal. I'm not going to gain 40 pounds in off season. I'm going to gain uh, 10, 15, right? And we'll manage this. And but I was progressively uh, getting bigger throughout the years from 91 yeah. to 99, if you remember. Yeah. Uh, so again, I, I like people to pay attention. So I, I don't want to sound maybe arrogant or you know, sarcastic, but you, you know that very well. People have excuses for their weaknesses. Yeah, they justify them. And mediocrity. Yeah. You want maximal, optimal, minimal, or zero. Right? Same thing as I was saying, I don't know if you've seen that one, uh, people uh, judge me. Uh, there was in the muscle or development, somebody asked me, uh, if any man can be skinny, undeveloped, obese, fat, out of shape, or muscular, what would they choose? So I said, if any man would say anything other than muscular, it's a fucking liar. 100%. 100%. Uh, 100%. But, no, 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 no. So not necessarily muscular to the point of pro bodybuilding, right? But athletic, you know, muscular, you know, you be strong. six pack, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, this, this kind of stuff. So, but a lot of people are lazy to do it, or a lot of people get themselves out of shape with a unhealthy lifestyle and the excuses that they have. I mean, you're 48 in top shape. You came here to train with me and then tomorrow with Neil, right? Mm -hmm. uh, after the COVID, after the uh, so many injuries, right? You have that drive in your way because you're a driven person and you don't lie to yourself. It's purpose and passion. You know, you enjoy it. And it has a transcendence effect into other areas of your life, you know, because you, there's going to be aspects in your life, whether it be business, relationship, whatever, that's uncomfortable, but you're able to attack it and uh, and th there's nothing that's kind of unexpected that could take you by surprise because you're used to it from having that pivotal foot in the gym. Now, just going back to your contest history, and this is just my opinion, um, so I, I'd like to get your cloudy. Like, I remember when you competed in the Night of the Champions with Marcus Rule and like Paul Dillett, like the big guys, and you came in same as you do, very symmetrical, but you look like you'd put on a lot of size for that show. Is that, 99. yeah, 99. 
Is that, because I remember, you know, their um, uh, Muscle News, it used to be uh, Muscle News in the UK, uh, but then later called The Beef. It was like a newspaper. I remember seeing those pictures. I was like, wow, okay, you packed on a lot of size. Is that because you knew that's what the New York crowd wanted? They they like the mass monsters? like the freaks. You see, I would, uh, and I tell you this, it's interesting that you remember that. Yeah, there was uh, also Pavel Ebonetsky that uh, competed in that show. Uh, in 99, uh, I didn't plan to even compete in those shows, but because I was always in a decent shape, right? On a few weeks, we said, okay, I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, why not? Uh, Marcus Rule. Yeah. Freak. Christ. Freak. Paul Dillette. Another freak. Sign, right? Yeah. You know, so I said, like, okay, let me see, you know, if I can match the fullness and size. And of course, I, I played top five. Uh, Dexter was third. Marcus was fourth. Yeah. Ebonensky second. Right? But yeah, uh, in the 99, I decided in all my shows, if you look, I was uh, second to Chris Cormier at the Iron Man. Yeah. And then I was top five at the Arnold Classic and then second in uh, uh, Canada Pro and uh, fifth at the Nano Champions. And then I was top 10 at Olympia and then to European Grand Prix Tour uh, with uh, Ronnie. That was a great tour. Ronnie Flex, Kevin. Dexter. Yeah, and and the the British GP was just yeah, legendary. Was also Marcus and Nasser, but I managed to be uh, top five in the, both of those shows, beat Nasser and Marcus. I I, I was so full that I wanted to create that. Okay, I have a deep separation. I have a shape. It's okay. Let me just see if I really push to the limits and uh, I have a fully loaded mass of glycogen. If I can, uh, uh, you know. Go a little higher, and I almost actually even beat the deck. So there was like a couple of points between. Yeah. And the only guys that would lose was uh, 99 Ronnie, phenomenal 99 Flex, and 99 Kevin. Kevin, yeah. Jesus. So, uh, you know, that was experiment. But uh, honestly, for me, I loved my 97 uh, physique better. I was smaller, uh, more aesthetic, more pleasing. It's just like, what do you do when uh, the best that you can look for this kind of body weight you can play top 10 and uh, you don't any you don't go any further and then you hear the experts telling you Milos, with a little bit more size you can maybe contend for a title it's okay let me give them what they want more size yeah yeah so but it wasn't me so what would yeah you yeah you you, you 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 definitely like it's like we could say the same with ronnie you know when he was a little bit smaller he looked better when he started pushing the envelope yeah it was enough for him to get him the crown but it was a little bit too much but the judges were pushing for it but just the last question here what was it that you did different in 99 compared to the years before where you came in that much bigger I, I did, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, when I was saying throughout the years, I liked my look. Before I started bodybuilding, I really, I uh, promise you this, I uh, visualized what I want my physique to look like. And by 97, I accomplished. That vision was in the mirror every time I, I looked. I won Canada 97, I was second in other champions 97. But I was only top 10 at Olympia, right? And then uh, 98, I kind of lost uh, uh, a contract from uh, sponsors. And uh, you know, my, my daughter was born and I needed more money. It's okay. So now 99 was the decision. Okay, I'm going to give them what they want or I'm just going to be stubbornly uh, doing what I think is best for me. So all that time, I could gain that size. I just didn't want that size. Ah, right. Okay. I didn't want it. So 99 is okay. I'll, I'll do it. That's what they ask. It's easy for me. I mean, really. And back in the day, uh, I would say to anyone, I could put 30 pounds in, in a couple of months, you know, just methodically twice a day, anabolic phase, drive, drive, drive nutrients in. I could. I could. I, I could even bet at that time, then give me somebody. In the thirty days, I'm gonna put. Uh, in the thirty days, I'm gonna put the thirty pounds on them, without changing the body fat level. And as I know, that's impossible. I would take a uh, large bets that I could do it, but I would lock you in in my house. I would train twice a day. I'm gonna feed you to the yin yang, right? 
I think that still to this day, a lot of people underestimate the caloric requirement, okay? Just to maintain caloric requirement to progress, to improve, to hypertrophy. First, you have to create a reason for your body to hypertrophy with the stimulation. Yeah. A lot of people train day in, day out without really triggering that response. They burn calories, they do some physical work, but they don't expose the body like I exposed you today to that discomfort. Stress. Yeah. Okay, something new. So now your body got the new impulse and needs to adapt to it. So it's gonna send it. And then that crazy pump that you had today, right? Mm -hmm. If we had a um, supplements, yeah, into workout supplementation, it would be much more progressive even today. Yeah. And then if you do this twice a day, six days a week. For a whole month, I mean, the results are astonishing. Yeah, I think that's what I'm going to give it a... I, like, of course, I'm getting a little bit older now, but I'm going to try that because I tend to do cardio. Yeah. I like cardio. I enjoy it, you know, but... That's I, good reason to do cardio. Yeah, I really enjoy it. But I, I it. Yeah, see, I don't mind it. Audio books, watch, watch a movie or listen to a podcast or whatever. But what I may try doing is doing some double workouts maybe like a larger muscle group in the morning, smaller muscle group in the evening. Yeah, well, I'm doing cardio anyway. So maybe one of those cardio sessions I'll replace with a weight training session. Um, sometimes, yeah, yeah. But let, you know, I'll do a little bit of post-workout and I'll do some in the morning, you know? Cause I, I like, I love cardio. You know, I do, you know, I've done Ironman triathlon. I, I, enjoy, I enjoy cardio. I was, gonna, I was but, just about to say like, what, what do you like about cardio for the load? <laughs> it's it's like meditative. It's an active meditation for me. <laughs> no, but I, I'm on that uh, that yeah, I, I can you know commend you for it. But look, you're super lean. Okay, so th this is also maybe tricky. Maybe somebody's going to be interested in in this. So me, possibly giving advising Chris, and Chris knows everything ten times over, and probably many things better than me. But. I, I, I don't think that you consider day in, day out, every moment, how to time the nutrients and supply most needed nutrients for the activity that is coming up. Yeah. So for me, that's why, uh, like I said, I prepare my blood if I'm going to send my blood to the working muscle. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So you don't need to prepare the blood for a cardio because cardio is going to just use a fatty acid. Of course. And you would preferably use fatty acids you want catabolic activity catabolizes your body fat yeah. during that uh, cardio. That's what you want, but not during anabolic activity. And uh, if you go to an anab anabolic activity workout, right? But you're unprepared. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then it could turn yeah. into further so catabolism. Said, if you uh, said to your wife, you know, go to the shopping mall with all these designers that she wants, oh, but she forgot the wallet. Can buy. Shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're there, but yeah. So it's the same thing. If you don't prepare, you know, your your uh, blood, yeah, or everything that with you with the want, nutrients, like glycogen. You know, yeah. So this is that little trick that uh, uh, I think would make a huge difference for you because I'm sure that you eat very clean. Yeah. And you, uh, I, uh, you never told me this, but I'm gonna guess you're probably little caloric deficient just in case because you don't. Get, you're probably for sure. For sure. Okay. And, I, and I have a huge appetite, so I don't have a problem with eating. Beautiful. So in this instance, I would just time it pre, intra and post. That's a period of time when you want to boost it. Everything else remains the same. I'm going to give you would see the difference. Definitely. I'm going to give that a shot. Yeah. I'm going to. Also, because you are a true athlete at heart. I mean, look at the, your conditioning and everything. And would I said it, I want to say publicly, I enjoy this kind of workouts when people come here exposed, so you tell me, uh, are you going to die under my sword, right? You're not going to back off. So, you know, I enjoy this workout probably more than you. <laughs> yeah, you probably did. Probably, yeah, yeah. yeah. Probably, definitely. Yeah, but that, I really, I really did enjoy this workout because, of course, I'm ready to surrender myself because there's so much I want to learn, and I know that I can learn from you, you know. And uh, it was painful, 
for sure. There's no doubt about it. But where pain sometimes comes pleasure, where sacrifice sometimes follows with success. So willing to do that. But Milos, thank you so much for this workout, for this podcast, for this time. Um, should anybody have any questions for you, which I'm sure a lot of people will, yeah. where, where can they find you? Uh, it's I'm on social media. I mean, I'm here. Yeah. Most consistent on Instagram. Milos Shachev. Right. If you can ever sell my name. We'll, we'll write this down in the show notes so people can find it. Yeah, I try really, um, I'm people's person. I love people. And I try to, uh, of course, answer as many, as many people as they, they question me. But as you know, sometimes it's just overwhelming. And sometimes you give the finger the one hand and yeah. like, hold on. You know, but uh, I've been speaking uh, this for 30 years. I don't have a secret. I honestly want everybody to succeed. I, I, it's a pleasure for me to have you train today with me because I, I had a piece of me that I share with you that if you value and you, you find something wrong, oh, this it makes sense, I, I'll I'm, do it. I'm a blind. You know, it's, it's very gratifying for me because the next time you train, it's like, oh, you know, but the feeling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I want people to try that too. Yeah, well, I'm sure oh, there's going to be a lot of people out there that's going to try this, but be prepared. Don't try this at home, kids, unless you've got a parent to advise you. But thank you, brother. Yeah. Appreciate it, mate. Pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you ever so much for listening. My name is Chris Gethin, and I am out.